Ladies and gentlemen, this is Johnny Jones of the Globe Syndicate speaking to you from Amsterdam, Holland, where I've been an eyewitness to the assassination of the Dutch cabinet minister Van Meer, the key figure of European politics. He alighted from his car and made his way toward me. Halfway, he was stopped by a news photographer who asked for a picture. Van Meer consented and was shot dead by a revolver held close to the photographer's camera. I pursued the assassin through the crowd only to lose him in traffic. Follow that car! Quick! Say, you better get out of here. This might be dangerous. You'll be silly, drive off. Trouble, who's he shot? Van Meer assassinated. No, Jeffrey Blythe didn't cover that assassination. But he did have a trench coat, and he did cover many very big stories, like the wedding of the year, and revolutions, pop sensations, and dictators. And of course, the assassination we will never forget. But let's go back to the beginning, way back when Jeffrey was just 16, working in South Shields at the Shields Gazette as a cub reporter for seven shillings a week. Then it was off to war, or at least off to being a 20-year-old reporter on Union Jack, the British Army newspaper which was published at the end of the war out of Venice. Jeffrey lived in a room right by the Rialto. On his 21st birthday, he got very drunk on grappa and never drank grappa again. But Venice, beautiful Venice, was the city he always loved. Then back to Britain first to Manchester and then to Southampton as a shipping correspondent for the London Daily Mail when sailing on the liners the United States or the Queen Elizabeth was the most glamorous way to travel to America. And it was also where Jeffrey got his first big scoop. He discovered the car the Soviet spies Burgess and McLean used when they boarded a boat in Southampton to flee England. Later in Moscow, Jeffrey learned from Guy Burgess that on that fateful night they were together in the bar of the San Malo boat. Of course, Jeffrey didn't know who Burgess was at the time. He said he once told the story about the odd coincidence to a colleague in Cairo, the Daily Telegraph reporter named Kim Philby. Philby, who became known as the third man, was also a Soviet spy, and needless to say, was amused. Next, there was Jeffrey's visit to Moscow with the first party of British tourists to enter the Soviet Union after the war. Note, Jeffrey was the only one in a blazer. All the others were communists. And at the time, there was also a plane crash or two, but that couldn't faze him because he was promoted to chief European correspondent just in time to cover the wedding of the year between actress Grace Kelly and Monte Carlo's Prince Rainier. At the wedding, he got his great world scoop that beat the 1,300 other reporters who were assembled for the event. Jeffrey got an exclusive interview the night before the wedding with Prince Rainier. How did he do it? He asked for it. And with Olivetti in hand, he flew across Europe and the Middle East from crisis to crisis, from the conflict in Suez to the bloody streets of Hungary. He got his news copy out of Budapest and into Vienna and onto the front pages of the mail by driving across a minefield. Watching the murder of Hungary was the story he said he never forgot. There were a couple of years when Jeffrey was practically everywhere in Europe, Asia and the Middle East. From interviewing Ingrid Bergman in Rome to flying to India and Afghanistan with Ike to spending weeks banqueting with Onassis and the king of Saudi Arabia, somewhere in the Arabian Sea. Yes, the king gave him that robe. Jeffrey was the Daily Mail's chief American correspondent for more than 15 years. During the time, he ran a London to New York air race that celebrated the anniversary of Alcock and Brown, the British pilots that first flew across the Atlantic. He was a founding member of the Overseas Press Club and president of the Foreign Press Association. Every day he covered another big American story, traveling often to Cape Canaveral to watch the space race unfold, to the south, to the marches, to witness the struggle for civil rights, the two great ongoing American dramas of the time. But there were two stories he always recalled, January the 1st, 1959. He was there when Castro took over Cuba 
in a way even helped Fidel. Jeffrey was in Havana on New Year's Eve when the dictator Batista fled. Castro was not yet in Havana. A few days later, Jeffrey and another reporter found out Castro was in a nearby small town. They went there and told Castro what was happening in the city. Most important, they told him that his followers had taken over the television station. That was all Castro needed to hear. Castro climbed into a jeep and headed for Havana. Jeffrey and his colleague followed right behind. Fidel went straight to the television station, demanded to be put on the air, and spoke to the people for seven straight hours. Jeffrey always said, and that was how Castro took Cuba. And then there was November the 22nd, 1963, 50 years ago, Dallas. On that Friday afternoon, after the news broke, there were no planes scheduled to fly to Dallas. Jeffrey knew the British press needed to be there for a Dallas, Texas dateline for their story that night. So he personally chartered a Boeing 707 and invited his press colleagues on board. He got the dateline and the splash. On the Sunday, he was in the Dallas police station, standing behind Oswald, when he was shot. He always said, from where he was standing, he thought the sound he heard was flash bulbs, not gunshots, until they carried the dying Oswald past him. After leaving the Daily Mail, Jeffrey reported for the London Sunday People, wrote a popular column for the Press Gazette for decades, and broadcast on radio daily for years for the BBC and then SABC. He reported the news of the day, the big and the small events, and the funny little stories about the American life he especially loved. Jeffrey Blythe was a courageous foreign correspondent, an admired colleague, and a great journalist. as Jeffrey Blythe reports from New York in five. It took the jury of eight women and four men two and a half hours to reach their verdict. At first, the jury was almost evenly divided on whether Rideout was guilty or not. But on the question of whether he'd used violence to force his wife to submit to him, there wasn't, the jury agreed, enough evidence to convict. Probably no case in an American court for a long time has created such interest. Women's group observers traveled from all over the country to attend the trial. Mrs. Rideout was obviously not happy over the verdict. Have you thought what might happen, though, if the dolphins do encounter the Loch Ness Monster? Are they likely to turn on their tails and run? <laughs> now, tell me, will you be using other methods this year, or are you going to rely just on the dolphins? Question material for Jack Griffiths of BBC Cardiff from Geoffrey Blythe in New York. Q material. New statistics just out show that New York is not, as many people think, the worst city in America for crime. Visitors to New York after they've been here a few days often say to me, we've been here nearly a week and haven't heard a shot fired yet. I tell them they're lucky, just stick around for a while. Actually, I have lived in New York off and on for more than 20 years, and in that time probably haven't heard shots fired, at least in anger, more than two or three times. In the neighborhood where I live, on the Upper West Side of New York, once a very fashionable neighborhood with big houses overlooking the Hudson River, there have been, within a mile of where I live, at least a dozen murders in the last five years. There was a taxi driver whose body was dumped in the park across the street, an old lady apparently killed for the few miserable possessions in her handbag and left buried under last winter's snow right under my bedroom window. And one or two assorted killers. What's the scene like in New York as, uh, as, as it all starts to happen? Well, it's all red, white and blue again. The flags and the banners, the same ones that were out last week for the Bicentennial and the Queen, they're flying again today. I thought there was a big scheme by Mayor Beam of New York to clean New York up for the convention. Well, that's true, and they've been trying, but it's a bit like King Canute sitting on the beach. Last week they raided one of the biggest pornographic bookshops on Times Square. They arrested the manager, but I see it's open again today. However, the city did pull one very crafty trick. It passed a new law, which went into effect yesterday, which makes it an offence for anyone to beckon to a stranger in the street. 
Of course, it's intended to stop the prostitutes soliciting. Well, the law will be challenged, but it may last a week, long enough for the police to drive the prostitutes off the streets. Actually, though, the people who are complaining about the new law the most are some political women's organisations. They've been planning some demonstrations this week outside Madison Square Garden, also some picketing. Well, now they fear that this new law, temporary though it may be, they fear it may be used to clear them off the streets too. Jeffrey, we've rather got the impression across here that everything is cut and dried as far as Jimmy Carter is concerned. Is that so in your view? Oh yes, I think so. Barring the most unexpected, there's no doubt that Carter will be nominated as the Democrats' candidate on Thursday night. Incidentally, one of the jokes here at the moment is that this is more of a coronation than a convention. It seems even Jimmy Carter's tell has got into the spirit. It's provided him with a fancy four-poster bed with a nice red canopy fit for royalty, they say. On the other hand, the last time it was seen, the four poster was in very different circumstances. It was in a very famous movie. It was the bed in which the Godfather slept. <laughs> very nice, Jeffrey. This is Jeffrey Blythe in New York.